So a couple of things that I like to submit to our group as we get started. From a preliminary standpoint, first and foremost, I just wanted to underscore and reiterate that anybody who is responsible for writing SOPs, we have to ensure that we are being concise because many steps are often included in your SOPs, procedures, and so forth. Writing with concise, targeted formatting, as we call it, is absolutely necessary. If a procedure can be shortened without losing meaning, my advisory recommendation is very simple, shorten it. To ensure that your readers can follow these procedures without getting lost in the lengthy test, please write with brevity, something that I submit out the gate as we get started this morning. I also submit to you, <clears throat> once we determine which procedures to write, we need to identify who is our intended audience as well, as we'll see momentarily within our presentation. However, at the very beginning of our presentation, we also want to reiterate and underscore the following. A very simple, fundamental question, where do we begin? How do you start writing SOPs? It's a lot easier than you think if you know that the analogy that I use is called a recipe, a GPS. A procedure is nothing more than a roadmap, a GPS, a tracking system that allows you to go in a straight line from point A to point Z hopefully without taking a lot of detours along the pathway. I submit to you, follow these five steps and you'll have a well-defined SOP manual of your critical policies, procedures, and forms, however. Most of our manufacturers at large do indeed have a quality index, a quality manual identifying all of your SOPs and very likely work instructions and other exhibits and compliance audible records that you are responsible for. Therefore, very important, that you map out your core processes. Define each core business process activities. Document each activity into a series of steps. Determine the required records, forms, and management metrics. Build your documents. This is part of the construction phase and how you compile information, your reports, your graphs, that will form the baseline, the foundation of your system. Therefore, the procedure it's very simple, prescribe specific ways of doing specific activities. That which regulates the formal steps into an action, whatever that may entail. It provides, without question, a series of steps followed in a particular order. This is all part of sequencing, as we'll see momentarily. But it's also important, as we go through this process, as we'll see at the end of our presentation, a well-written procedure will be structured in three different tiers of information typically used by our global manufacturers at large. This is the reason why the layer states unequivocally why the SOP is being written, which is why we have an objective and scope, intended purpose, what specifically is this purpose, and when and where should that information be applied, which is the scope. We will go through each of these terms and elements that comprise your format, your template, your boilerplate that comprises your company's SOP during our presentation, however. I'm also going to discuss what are the list of the five of the top mistakes we find time and time again with SOPs, as well as other tips that are going to be provided to our audience at large today to certainly improve your SOPs or even your induction into your training manuals. And we'll certainly go into additional detail, details and steps as to why that's gonna be important. But it's also important to understand the interactions between you, the resources, the personnel, controls, change management, systems, equipment, technology, materials, whether you're a manufacturer or non-manufacturer, the key denominator that we all share is predicated upon one word, procedures. The procedures, i.e. SOPs, including guidance documents, corporate policies, work instructions, and the like, truly do establish and define the foundation, the baseline of your quality management system. However, at the end of our presentation, we'll certainly talk about training and how to test out your SOP, and more importantly, how to review the effectiveness of the SOP. And there are different tactics, strategies, techniques 
uh, that can certainly be considered em employed on your behalf as we go through this process. But make no mistake, training is going to be a common denominator, as we all know, in this industry. And it's imperative and incumbent upon you to ensure that personnel are being trained on only new procedures, but also revised, modified, edited procedures. And we'll go through some examples as to why that's important momentarily. So you want to start with a process map, a visual. A visual depiction is always nice to have. So the first step of writing SOPs is to start with a process map of your top-level processes. For hypothetical reasons, for discussion point only for today's presentation, we're going to take one example that will be symbolic of how this process will start. For example, for most companies, your top 10 core business processes or operations are divided into support operations or processes, including accounting, finance, HR, IT, QA, QC, regulatory, marketing, sales, compliance, management, management strategy, and so forth. Or your realization process, which could be sales, contract review, contract management, product development, R&D, purchasing, fulfillment, and so forth. Now, make no mistake, not all companies have all 10 core processes. It's going to vary as we know. Now that you have your core operating processes defined, you're now ready to move on to defining each process. So what does that entail? The process map visually describes the flow of activities of your process. The flow can be defined as a sequence and interactions of related process steps, activities, tasks, or subtasks that make up an individual process from pre to post, beginning to end, or as we call it, cradle to grave. A process map, made no mistake, is read from left to right or from top to bottom, but it provides a visual depiction. Again, the analogy that we use, a GPS, a roadmap. Secondly, while writing your SOPs, we want to define each core business process and its subsequent activities. Again, we're macro, we're not micro yet. This means we need to think top level once again. For example, in the sales process, how are your orders converted into a shift product? For example, high level again, orders are received, entered, picked, packed, shipped, and invoiced. Why is that important? Because when we migrate to our third step or phase, we want to document each operation from start to finish. So let's take the sales process as our example today. How do your sales orders arrive? Who takes them? How often? On the white prescribed criteria, qualitative or quantitatively speaking. Who touches the order next? What do they do? And so on. Just follow the sales order process through your system. As you do this, define each step along the way, clearly, concisely, and without ambiguity. Now you're on the way to writing a procedure in your SOP manual, and this is a slowly building process. Analogy again, this is a construction project of your SOP development, implementation, deployment program. Fourth would be your records other artifacts or exhibits to be created. This could be your records, forms, management metrics, and a list of other items. For example, do you have a standard order form, confirmation checklist, a peg sheet, or invoice? We need to know what forms to use. It's not just for an SOP, but we are also going to be generating other artifacts and exhibits to ensure, confirm, authenticate that the procedure is actually being followed. In other words, we need to have incontrovertible evidence and proof that these records are available and they are in alignment with the procedure as written by you. For example, what forms are going to be used? Where are they located? Who maintains them in case we run out and have to get more? Identify the core metrics for each activity, the transaction volume and timing, because we're going to need these next. Finally, when you're ready, put these together compile them together, the SOP manual, and start using the system. Start the operations manual with your core processes mapped out in step one. Explain each core business process with the material from step two, as an example. Then, dive into each process with the individual procedure steps outlined from step three. As you go through this process, something to, to consider. Add references to each record or form as applicable as appropriate, as you touch on them in the detailed procedure steps with the notes from step four. Again, this is high-level recommendation only, but you do want to map out 
your process. You just don't start writing procedures without understanding what your end result is. What is the desired outcome? You want to be very formalized, very methodical, very systematic, and not do this in a non-methodical or haphazard manner, which means you have to redo and undo. So be proactive and not reactive as you go through this process. It's also important to underscore a couple things. Although our topic today is SOP, Standard Operating Procedures, I do want to provide some clarity in terms of the difference between work instructions and procedures. A lot of our companies are using SOPs, made no mistake about that. Conversely, many of our companies are using WIs, work instructions. So for clarity, I submit to you, work instructions tell you how to do something. They are very specific instructions with much more minutia, typically. For example, how to complete a form. That can certainly be accomplished, facilitated, and handled via a work instruction. However, I submit to you, for procedures tells you who does what and when. In other words, it identifies who completes the form and when this should occur. This is how we like to differentiate between procedure and work instruction. SOP is a macro document. A work instruction would be your micro document. Or better yet, in simple terms, and I submit to our group today, procedures tell you who, what, and when. Work instructions tell you how. Now, I submit to you. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes to watch this clip from one of our online meetings. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, stay up to date, and stay compliant. This video was brought to you by GRCTS. We are also known as GRC Training Solutions. And here's a quick information about us and what we do. We conduct many compliance and non-compliance training courses throughout the year, covering some of the most important areas within several industries. Our focus is to provide the best and the most up-to-date classes to our audience. All training modules are designed and facilitated by industry subject matter experts who possess years and years of experience and understand compliance very well. Our customers attend our online classes from all over the world. If you're not available to attend live meeting classes, you can always opt in to get unlimited access to our on-demand or recorded classes. We also provide in-person and face-to-face -face workshops, on-site workshops where our experts will visit your company at your location and train you and your colleagues, LMS trainings, and finally, corporate subscription plans, where you pay a little amount to enjoy unlimited access to our courses. We have monthly, quarterly, and annual subscription plans. Here's our contact information for you. If you're interested in learning in any of these topics, or if you know a colleague or a friend who might benefit from our classes, please contact us or visit our website for more information. It's www.grcts.com. You can always send us an email, support at grcts.com, or just give us a call, 248-233-2049.